Let's take our Bibles. I'm going to spend some time in the Word tonight. I'm going to ask you to turn back to the book of Exodus this evening. Exodus chapter number 15. We'll get there in just a few minutes. And as you all know, we've spent our Wednesday nights since the new year considering uh, some truths, some thoughts, some meditations for my own quiet time. And uh, I've told you each week that my, my goal is just to share with you a truth that jumps off the page at me during my personal study of the Word with the desire and the hope that these studies will challenge each of us to think deeply and to meditate on the Scriptures as we read them ourselves throughout this year. For several services of this new year on Wednesday nights, we looked at either the Psalms or the book of Proverbs. Last week, we turned to the book of Matthew, and tonight, as I've asked you to turn to the book of Exodus, we're going to spend some time here really looking at a Psalm of Moses or a Song of Moses here in the book of Exodus. Now, I will say as we turn here that I'm, I'm sure that you, like I, have noticed this text in your Bible before. Uh, this text won't be, I think, strange to your ears. But what is so striking to me about this song is the fact that it was sung over the dead bodies of the enemies of God's people. God had drowned the armies of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, and now God's people under the leadership of Moses are are singing the praise of God over the bodies of their enemies. And tonight I just want to start by reading the text, and then there's just three thoughts from the passage I want to point out to us tonight and show you some of the undergirding theology that we find in the psalm or in the song throughout. So Exodus chapter 15, I'm going to start at verse 1, I want to read down through verse 18, As we read through this song of Moses found here. The text says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk into the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed, trembling seas as the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. 
you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which you, your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. I've read this text many times, but I'll tell you, reading through it again this last week, it grabbed my attention once again. I couldn't, I couldn't read past it. I had to go back and read it again. I found myself reading it three or four times through this week, coming back to the words of this song. And as I noted at the outset, in this song of praise, there are three points at which Moses kind of pulls back from the specifics of the situation And he roots his praise in the undergirding character of God. It's interesting to me how often we find ourselves running to God in times of desperation, right? Many times, sadly, we run to God only when he brings us to the end of ourselves finally, rather than regularly running to God as our God. We find ourselves desperate. We need something now. We need health. We need help. We need supply. We need something. And so we run to God in our desperation. And then what do we praise God for? Whatever He gave us. He healed. He gave. He supplied. There was money. There was, there was health. There was protection. There was this. There was that. There was the other. And many times what saddens my heart is the temptation in my own soul. I think the temptation we all face of using God pretty much like a vending machine. You put in your coins, we call that prayer, and you get out an answer. We call that supply. And you wouldn't praise the vending machine for giving you what you think you deserve because you put in what it costs and you get out what it gives. And sadly, God becomes to many, even many professing Christians, nothing much more than a cosmic vending machine. We run in our desperation, we offer our prayers, that's our form of payment. We show up at church, we give in the offering, we do what we need to do, and we expect that God must give me what I ask for, and then we praise what we receive. We we, we make much of that, that moment that He just dispensed to us the supply, or He gave to us the health, or He gave to us the protection. And what I find amazing in this song is that Moses praises God, yes, for the protection He supplied, but he sang praise to God because He's God. Not just because He defeated the enemy. I love how this song, at least three times, Moses pulls back from the talking about the enemies and talking about the sea to talk about the God who did these things for him. And all we see in this song is the praise of God. Yes, God did a mighty thing for them, but a praise of God because he's God. We see it all over the song. So tonight I just want to spend some time asking us some questions as we look at this to see, do we think like this? Do I think like this? Do you think like this? Because we run to God many times when we have need. And when we have need, we should run to God. But what praise do we offer when God moves mercifully, graciously, savingly for his people? Do we praise Him for who He is? Or do we stop at whatever it is He's done? And tonight I want you to see for just a few moments how this works together in this song. It's it's just, like I said, captivated my attention again this week. I want us to think together about these things. And so I want you to notice these three statements from the psalm. And and the first thing I want you to notice is that, that Moses tells us, and the people sang, that the Lord is a strong Savior. The Lord is a strong Savior. Notice what we saw in verse 2, where they just praise God. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. In the midst of making much of what God has just done, it's as if He pulls back and says, but let's remember who this is we're singing to. Don't miss the way that it's woven into the first few verses. It just fits there with the things that He writes, or that they sang, I should say, that are now being written down here in Moses' writing. 
verse 1, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And what did they sing? I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Yes, he praised God for what he did. But why? Because he is his strength. And he said, I will praise him. I will exalt him. How often is our praise, does it stop with the stuff? Look at the car he supplied. Look at the way he paid my bill. Look at the way I'm healthy when I wasn't. Look at this, look at that. Yes, talk of his wondrous deeds, but don't stop with them. Does he receive your worship and your praise? Is your life about him or just what he has done for you? Brethren, the one should point us to the other. What he does should be that pointer that brings us back to him. I love how the old hymn writer talked about when we get finally to Emmanuel's land. He says, I won't gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. He says, not, I'm not going to gaze at the crown he gives, but on his pierced hand. Do, Do you and I wrestle with this at all? Or do we get in such ruts when it comes to our spiritual walk that it's like, God gets what he gets from me. And let's not even bother ourselves much further about this. The fact that I praised it all should be enough. And what we find here is many times he doesn't get the praise he deserves from the lips of his own. In fact, there's not much thought at all many times. We pray and we pray and we pray and he answers. And then where's the praise? Where's the thanks? Where's the honor? Where's the glory? Oh, I love how these, after being so fearful on the other side of the sea, now on the day of victory, did not forget how they got to where they were and who it was who brought them there. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. You see, Moses and the people made much of the fact that the Lord is a strong Savior. And as they watched the way God supplied protection for them, they made much of it. But I want you to notice, secondly, from this song, not only is the Lord a strong Savior, but secondly, in verse 11, Moses and the people pull back again, and they say that the Lord is God alone. The Lord is God alone. Listen to how they sing, verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? I remember hearing once, I don't remember exactly how the story went, but the story went something like this. Someone was finding themselves in a moment of desperation, praying and praying and praying. Oh God, oh God, oh God, would you supply? And and the next thing they know, like a neighbor shows up and brings them what they need. And they, they cut off their prayer in the middle. Oh Lord, never mind, my neighbor's got it. I wonder how often you and I think like that. Oh, Lord, would you do for me? And what we think is, well, I'll take supply from whoever will bring it, not realizing that every good and perfect gift comes down from above. The breath in our nostrils, the strength in our muscles, we've talked about this, the clarity in our minds, everything. Christ was clear, without me, you can do nothing. And yet, so often, We just don't think like that. So here they are on the other side of the sea. And what are they saying? There is is no one. There is nothing that calls itself a God that can even begin to be compared with you. There is no one like you. There is no one holy and glorious and wonderful like you are. And yet it's amazing how easily captivated the professing people of God's attention is. How quickly our hearts are drawn away from the worship of the the Almighty One. How how, how short-lived moments of praise and worship can tend to be. 
How easily distracted, how captivated we are by our own providing for our own needs. And what do they say here? No, 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 no. Our protection, our strength, our provision, our supply, our lives come from God and there is no one like him. I wonder, friends, do do you find yourself in your daily life coming to times of reflection on the greatness of God that are accompanied by rhetorical questions like these? Look at the questions. Who is like you, O Lord? Do you ever do that? You ever find yourself looking at a sunrise or a sunset going, God, you are amazing. Who else could paint like you paint? Right? Do you find yourself praising God with, with questions like these? Because we find these kind of questions all over Scripture. I mean, this is how the people of God have, have thought through the ages. Just consider the way the psalmist did something similar. You know these words in Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. It's where my mind ran as I was reading the text of, uh, of Exodus 15. Uh, we read this. When I look at your heavens, for some of the reasons we sang what we did tonight. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, I yawn and go back to bed. Move on to other things because I just don't have time to really pay attention to creation anymore. I'm busy. I'm busy, right? No, when I look at the creation, I can't help but ask, what is man that you even think about him? The son of man that you visit him. Do you ask questions like these in your praise? Do you ask yourself questions that make you meditate on on God? Or how about questions like the the prophet Isaiah asked in Isaiah 40. My mind just started racing to some of these questions in Scripture. In the middle of this chapter, this prophetic chapter, he he asked questions like this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and and, and marked off the heavens with a span and and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? That whole verse is a series of questions. Who else can do that? Who else palms the universe? Who else has this kind of power? Who else is so immense that nothing can compare to him? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him counsel? Verse 14, another question. Who did he consult and who made him understand? Or another question. Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Do you and I meditate on God so that it causes us to to ask questions in our own soul about this comparison? And we wrestle with these kinds of ideas and come to the conclusion that the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is God alone I wonder do you and I wrestle with that do we find ourselves in moments of desperation crying out to God and saying God if you don't do this nothing will make this right if you don't solve this I will not find a solution God if you do not move in my heart I will not live and think and speak as I ought oh God you are God alone you are God and I am not you are God and we are not do we think like this Or do we read over questions like this in the text? Do we find ourselves reading right over things where God amazingly provided for his people? And we go, hmm, that's neat. Now let's move on because we've got stuff to get to, right? Like how, how much does the praise of God cause us to pause our lives and wrestle with who he really is? I don't know about you, but I I need the word to check me. I need the word to stop me short. I need the word to pause me because we are prone to living life very self-sufficiently. And if I can't provide for my need, then I'm going to find somebody who will, but we're going to make the life we want work. And what do we find the people of God saying? All of life is all about God and God alone. Because he is the only God. There is no other. 
We find them saying plainly as they sing that the Lord is a strong Savior and the Lord is God alone. But as you might imagine, because you've been with us long enough and seen this again and again in the scriptures, I want you to notice thirdly that they sing that the Lord is sovereign over all. In verse 18, they use this language. The Lord will reign forever and ever. I find it astounding that this whole song is a comparison between the seeming might of man, which is no might at all, and the ultimate and eternal sovereignty of God. Did you notice as we read in this text, the thinking of the enemy? We saw it in verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. This is, this is a planner. <laughs> This is one who thought ahead and said, here's how we're going to do it. Here's what we're going to, uh, what we're going to do. Here's, here's how we're going to win. Here's how we're going to get what we want. And we're just going to go out there, pull out our swords, and we're going to do what we want. Verse 10. You blew with your wind. <laughs> and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Do, do you see the comparison between... The self-sufficient and the truly sovereign. The one who says, I'll do what I want. I'll get what I want. I'll go where I want. I'll pursue who I please. I will win the day. I will make my plan and I will fulfill my plan. And God <laughs> blows. And the sea covers them. There's a reason why James will say, uh, you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such city and buy and sell. And he's not talking to the lost. He's talking to the professing church, right? The, the believers. I'm going to go at this time to this place for this long and I'm going to make this much money and I'm going to come back and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to work my plan. And what does James say? Fools. You ought to say, if the Lord wills. First, he begins with, we will live. <laughs> if the Lord wills, we will live. And if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. But only if the Lord wills. And I'm wondering... If we have grabbed on to that kind of thinking yet. <laughs> Only if the Lord wills. Will I even wake up tomorrow morning? Only if the Lord wills. Will there be enough to supply for my financial need? Only if the Lord wills. Will there be clarity enough to... Put two thoughts together and speak as I ought to speak for his glory. Only if the Lord wills. Why? Because he is sovereign over all. I love how in this text the singers of this song Connect the majesty, the authority, the sovereignty, the, the, the kingship of the Lord to his act of protection of them. Right in the middle of the song, we read in verses 6 and 7, this praise of God. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Like like a glass that's dropped from your hand and splintered into a thousand pieces. 
It's so brittle. It's so fragile. It, it can't protect itself. No, God, your power shatters the might of the armies of the nations. But how fearful do the people of God tend to be the minute any opposition comes against us? And it points to the glorious power of God. Keep reading. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. And it consumes them like a giant stump that won't go away. It burns on them and burns on them and burdens on them. And sometime, maybe down the road, it'll finally blow away. No, when your fury goes forth, it just consumes like stubble and they're gone. I think sometimes we think that our God just has to be a little bit stronger than the enemy. And as long as he's a little bit stronger, we'll be okay in the end. We think that somehow we bought into this kind of Eastern mystical view that, that good and evil are in some kind of eternal battle. And, and, and we know because we've read how it's going to finally work out in the end, but we're just not really sure because you look around us and it, it looks like evil's winning everywhere. And we're not really sure. I mean, as long as God's just at least a little bit more powerful than the enemy, then, then, then okay, we have hope that it might be all right. D does this paint God out to be just a little bit stronger? Like, you know, it's like your team has a little advantage in the game. No, he rules over everything. And when he blows some wind from his nostril, the armies blow away like chaff that just burns up and is gone. The, he blows with his nostrils and the sea rises and washes enemies away so that armies are no more. And yet we're afraid. Life's going to get a little hard and we're not going to like it and we're not sure who's going to win and how it's going to go. Brethren... The Lord is the sovereign over all. Do you believe that he will reign forever and ever? You know, the principles taught in this text, friends, make clear the fact, this was my meditation this week, that our security in this life and the next is rooted in God's sovereignty overall. If that isn't true, you might as well hang it up now. Because when you go to the text of Scripture, it tells you your hope is in him and in him alone. My security, your security in this life and in the life to come is rooted securely and squarely in God's sovereignty. If he does not rule forever and ever, if he does not reign forever and ever, we have no security. We have no hope. And this is why again and again and again, as you study the scriptures, you find the people of God when they give praise to God, when he moves on their behalf and he supplies for their needs and he protects their lives and he meets every, every concern of theirs. What they praise is that he is God and he is God alone, the ruler over everything. And I have to ask, when God meets your need, when God protects your life, when God supplies what you lack, is your praise and is mine the kind of praise we find through the scriptures? Are we praising him because he is a strong savior?
Are we praising him because he is God alone? Are we praising him because he is the sovereign over all? Or are we still squirming when we read things like this? Or are we rejoicing in the God who is the God alone, the sovereign? Over all that is. Friends, we need to think and we need to live. We need to pray like we believe this is true. So as we go to prayer tonight then, what I want us to do is I want us to pray as if we believe every word of it. (laughs) Every word of it. There, There are needs that we have. We'll ask you to share some of those in a minute. But my friends, what confidence do you and I have when we come to the throne of grace? Notice the throne of grace, right? Not the easy chair of grace, not the rocking chair of grace. The throne. Why? Because it's not the picture of a grandpa on a front porch who might have enough to supply. It's the picture of a king on his throne, and we come confident that he is ruling over all and he is a king of grace he dispenses what his people need let's pray like that tonight all right